en ik echt. Dus Koute Darmoni, the floor is yours. Bonsoir. Ik ben bekend om van talen te wisselen, maar ik ga, ik, wie begrijpt geen Engels? That's the advantage of living in Holland. Everybody more or less understands English, right? So I will do it in English, but of course sometimes I will switch to Dutch and sometimes to French and sometimes to Arabic. No, I will stick to English. <laughs> And Dutch. Um, Fatima Bernisi, to react on what uh, Nadia was saying, when I, um, I grew up in Tunisia and when I was very, very much influenced d d by, by Western feminism and then I left Tunisia, I was extremely angry at my Arab Muslim culture and the oppression of women and I didn't want to do anything, have to do anything to do with Muslim culture or women or anything. I just escaped and I was fascinated by Western feminism and I wanted only to belong to the group of Western feminists and to gender studies and I was the only dark basically person into amongst white women gatherings, hardcore feminists, very, very, you know. <laughs> just the tough ones and I remember I was very young and then there were three things that I found very strange but I thought like oh I have to adapt uh, the first thing was um, what was it again yes uh, the emancipated look of hardcore Western feminists no sexy clothes no epilation no makeup That's the look. Okay, we're gonna go for the look. D'accord. Okay, number one. Number two, number two was the male bashing thing. It was really very, very, very tough for men. I mean, I, th I thought Arab women, we were tough with men, but woo, Western feminists, that was real thing. Male bashing. Tack. And the third thing was, this was a little bit, it took me a while to understand that, but okay. Uh, Heterosexuality was a form of institutionalized rape culture. So basically, if you have heterosexual sex, you are approving of the rape culture. I thought this is a little bit strange, but I come from an Arab Muslim culture where we are all the time repressed, and if these very smart, white, intelligent, Western feminist, hardcore, came to this conclusion, who am I? to argue with this. So, I adapt because this is one of my biggest uh, strength qualities. I just, I am very good like chameleon to adapt. So I adapted. <laughs> It was two years of adaptation. So uh, basically no epilation through all the makeup. I, th I remember I bought three overalls that I was wearing all the time. <laughs> C'était très confortable, but not very sexy of course. And I had hair pushing everywhere. <laughs> I remember I was in Tunisia, I was in the hammam, and then the women of my family, they were looking at me, it's like, why? And I was like, why not? <laughs> why? I said, yeah, it's your problem because you are all the time taking off everything, why should you? And then my mother was horrified, like, you look like a gorilla, you will never find a husband like this. <laughs> But anyway, after, during these two years, That, that was one of the achievements. The second achievement was that the boyfriend left me because he was fed up with male bashing and of uh, leaking bush bush. <laughs> and the third, the third try out, I tried to, to, to get out of uh, uh, heterosexual rape culture to switch from heterosexuality to homosexuality. I tried, but at the end, Also for me, licking bush bush was not my preference. <laughs> anyway, to make it short, I was extremely confused. So there were a lot of things, which I, but I, I, I didn't know how to, how, to, how to get out of this. And I remember there was, because I was attending a lot of conferences and symposium and everything about feminists, and there was this a professor from Berkeley. I was in America and he said, I, I was telling him, there is a part of hardcore Western feminist which I cannot identify with, but I think I have a problem. And he said, why don't you read Mernisi? I said, Mernisi, who is that? I said, she's an Arab Muslim feminist. I thought, does it exist, Arab Muslim feminist? He said, well, you read her, you will see. 
And that was for me the first um, adventure and like a long, long love affair with Fatima Bernisi, which really I could relate to a lot of her work personally, because for me this is also academia. Academia is not only like an abstract thing which I work with with my students, for example. It's something that I have to feel in my brain and in my body as well. And I think this is one of the uh, uh, most interesting part about Mernice's way of uh, being an academic is she was for me a very um, sensual academic. Her work was um, uh, anchored into the body, into history, into a lot of rituals about the female body. And um, her first book, which I really found for me was really mind-blowing, was Beyond the Veil. I remember I read it in two days and I couldn't sleep because I was so fascinated. It was like coming back home. It was, I remember I was crying and I was crying because when I left Tunisia and I, I decided to go to the West, I, I felt so ashamed of the culture where I came from. And I wanted so badly to belong to the new country, to the new culture, to the European culture. But at the same time, there was part of the European feminist culture, the hardcore ones, which I couldn't relate to. So I was, for me, it was Mernissi was like, finally, these two worlds were meeting in a very harmonious way. Um, in her book, uh, I, I will share with you for what was for me the few breaking through uh, concepts, intellectual concepts in Mernissi work, which for me were really important as uh, academic, but also as a woman. The first thing in her Beyond the Veil is when she explains that in Arab Muslim uh, tradition, actually, female sexuality is powerful and active. So actually, not powerless and passive as often described in Western tradition. Um, I quote Mernissi. Mernissi says, in Western culture, sexual inequality is based on belief in women's biological inferiority. In Islam, there is not such a belief in female inferiority. On the contrary, the whole system is based on the assumption that women are powerful and dangerous beings. <laughs> well, like, this is interesting. All the sexual institutions like polygamy, repudiation, sexual segregation can be perceived as a strategy for, for um, containing their power. So that was for me the first eye-opener because as a child, I remember my grandmother grew, also grew up in a harem and I also uh, uh, received this culture, is why are Arab Muslim men all the time locking women into harems, into houses, into veils, into burqas. Why? So the only answer that I could have as a child, and especially because I was looking to Western women as being powerful and emancipated, and they had 68 revolution, and they were really moving, I thought, okay, so Arab Muslim women probably are weak and powerless. That's it. Voila. But Mernissi, she demonstrates the opposite. It's because they are so powerful, and especially their sexuality is so strong, that they are locked. And um, the um, uh, Quran and the hadith uh, of the hadith is the interpretation, and the, what, what the Prophet Muhammad said about the Quran is, um, which was stepping back to the seventh century, uh, talking and debating about sexuality and sexual topics was very normal already in the seventh century, even in most cases. It was very normal to debate about sex and sexual issues. So actually, through Manisi, I discovered that Arab Muslim culture is quite open and progressive about sex, and not as I thought in my mind. And, um, and other, uh, uh, Mernissi, she used a lot, Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali is one of the biggest reference into Arab Muslim theology. And uh, she mentions Ghazali, the polarization of human sexuality in two kinds, feminine and masculine, and their equation with passivity and activity is opposite to Imam Ghazali theory. Imam Ghazali is from the 11th century, he is a scholar, which is characterized by the absence of such a polarization. It conceives of both male and female sexuality belonging to the same kind of sexuality. So there is not such a thing as a difference between male and female sexuality. It's one. This polarization in the Muslim scholarship doesn't exist. The difference in the patterns of ejaculation, the difference in the pattern of ejaculation between the sexes is a source of hostility whenever a man reaches his ejaculation before the women. I thought like, oh, très très bien, on parle d'ejaculation. Oh. 
the women's ejaculation is much slower process. I thought, Master and Johnson's. Okay. And during that process, her sexual desire grows stronger and to withdraw from her before she reaches her pleasure is harmful to her. So basically what all these Arab Muslim men are telling us all the time about sex, it's absolutely not true. Because if you follow the books, uh, it has never been the case. So actually the discourse and in the, in the Muslim tradition itself, there is enough material for women emancipation, especially when it comes to sexuality. It's not something like what a lot of women believed also, like emancipated women in a lot of Arab Muslim culture. We always associate Western emancipation, openness about sex, to, to, with the West, we, to, while in the Arab Muslim culture we have such a tradition as well. But okay, I think Arab, Arabs, including myself in those times, are amongst the most ignorant about their tradition, and especially when it comes to religion. But this is changing. So um, I come to the next point of... Um, uh, this is an anecdote because uh, Mernissi also she says um, the necessity, this is a, a citation or a quote also from Imam al-Ghazali, the necessity for the male to satisfy the female sexual desire becomes a compelling social duty. It's a duty. The virtue of the woman is a man's duty. And the man should increase or decrease sexual intercourse with the woman according to her needs so as to secure her virtue. We are talking about literature from the 11th century. Yeah? The Ghazalian theory directly links the security of the social order to that of the woman's virtue and sexual pleasure and needs to the satisfaction of her sexual needs. I have an anecdote. My father is an imam and he was a very still, misogynist imam. And my mother comes from a village near uh, Tunisia, a small village, where it's, uh, it, was, it was called 06. 06 is the indicative of Nice, because the majority of the men of that village were working in Nice. They come once a year for two months, they ta 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 ta, -ta with a the woman, they make sure they are pregnant, then she's quiet for nine months until they come the next year to do again their duty. But the women, of course, they spend the whole year, uh, like we say in, in Tunisia, sheikhin, sheikh, it means dry. So sometimes they go downtown to the big city and they have some affairs. So my father, every time when he wanted to, to make sure that the order was in the house, he would say, and yes, this immoral woman from the village of your mother, I'm sure you are getting a little bit of their spirit because this is not okay what you do. And I remember after reading Mernissi, I went back to my father and I had a whole debate about him because I said with him, I said, it seems that it's the man's duty to make sure that the sexual needs of women are satisfied. And because the men of this village are not taking of the sexual needs of the women, so it's normal that the women go look for somewhere else. We have fitna, but it's the responsibility of men. He didn't like it, but he never ever argued with me again about the subject. And that's for me, was such an empowering experience because to be able to stay in the Muslim tradition and to debate about this kind of issue while staying into that uh, dynamics and of the Quran, to use the books but to give them another interpretation, especially with my father, because that is such an empowering experience. And I think this is also what Mernissi is trying to show us. At least I talk about us as a lot of Arab women who are completely or were completely fascinated by Western emancipation is into your own culture, into your own tradition, there is enough material to emancipate. You don't have to go look somewhere else. And this is really one of the most empowering lessons that a lot of feminists learn from Bernisi. And then I go to her second book, which for me, there were two books which really I, I, I had big impression on me, which I also use a lot in my work in, in gender studies. It's, of course, Beyond the Veil, and Shahrazad Goes West. Shahrazad Goes West is a very funny book. Um, 
because Ornisi, Mernisi was not only a fierce critic of the Arab Muslim segregation, but she also had a lot of criticism towards uh, Western culture. And, and uh, Shahrazad goes west, Mernisi argues that where the, the, the East subordinated women by controlling uh, space, because they are not allowed to go to the outside space and they have to stay in the inside space, the West created the harem by controlling time. Now, in the beginning, I thought controlling time. What does she mean by that? But it's very interesting how she explains that. So basically, and here I quote Mernisi, and like the Muslim man who uses the space to establish male domination by excluded, excluding women from the public arena, the Western man manipulates time. He declares that in order to be beautiful, a woman must look like a 14 years old. I mean, if you nowadays you open a Vogue or Cosmopolitan and you only see that, c'est vraiment scandaleux. These Western attitudes, I thought, are even more dangerous and cunning than the Muslim ones because the weapon used against women is time. The violence embodied in the Western harem is less visible than in the Eastern harem because aging is not attacked directly, but rather masked in an aesthetic choice. We are so much into aesthetic, and we like so much beauty, and this is why we like youth. This is the discourse. So, as an aging woman, you feel not only very ugly, but also quite useless in Western cultures. You drift in the frings of nothingness. The idea gives me the chills because it tattoos the invisible harem directly into a woman's skin. And here, this is what I experienced myself, and I arrived in the West quite young. It's that uh, beauty myth prison. It's Europe was for me the first continent and place where I, start, where I heard like nonsense about women's size and women's age. Where I grew up in Tunisia, it's like in the, in the uh, book of Mernisi, we are always in the hammam, we are in houses, we dance together, women are naked, they are dressed, they are not dressed, they are fat, they are thin, they are old, they are young, who cares, you know? Uh, it's like, I remember my first, when I, when I arrived to Holland, I had one of my best uh, Dutch girlfriends, and I always said to her, we go to the hammam, we go to the hammam, and every time she tells me, like, no, 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 no. And then after one year and a half, I said, why you don't want to come with me to the hammam? And she looked at me and said, because I'm too fat. And I was like, what? And I remember I looked at her and I said, but I am not a man. Because we don't look at women like this. We, don't, we, we did not internalize the, the male gaze of how a woman should look like, because we have this space. And by reading Mernisi, I discovered that what I always considered as the curse and the malediction of Arab Muslim culture, which is this strict segregation between women and men, had also a wonderful positive part, which is we didn't have a male gaze telling us how we should look like and how our bodies should look like. We were free. We enjoyed our bodies. We, we embraced our sensuality. We could be sensual and sexual and crazy in these spaces without being afraid of looking sexual because there were main, main, men looking at us or maybe we have too much cellulite or too much this or too much that. It didn't exist. Can you imagine a world where you don't have that? That's really freedom, right? Or am I inventing it? <laughs> a lot of women recognize that, not the prison of the beauty ideal, how it should look like. And I remember one of the first experiences I had in the West when I arrived, I was, I was young and I was scouted in the street by a model agency and they, they, they wanted an exotic thing into their agency because they had only white and blonde and blah, blah, blah. So I thought like, oh, instead of working at McDonald's, I can work a model agency. Very nice. So I went there. I was 54 kilos. The first thing they look at me and they said, you have to lose weight. Your derriere is too big. OK, j'ai un derrière assez prominent, d'accord? <laughs> but OK, I was 54 kilos, come on. And they said, OK, so you, if you lose uh, kilos, then you can come. So I, 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 I killed myself. I lost six kilos. I looked like skeleton. But still, my derrière was prominent. 
And then the lady, she looked at me and she said, if you wish, you can make an operation to make it smaller and this will reduce later from the costs of your salary. Oui, 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 oui. And then I thought like, okay. And that's for me, I remember I had the period after that where I was completely depressed. I was very insecure about my body. I didn't dare to be naked again. I, I, I really thought my body is wrong. But thanks God, I went to Tunisia for two months and I had the whole cure of eat, 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 dance, 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 hamem, 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 and it was fine. But it's very damaging for your self-esteem and body image as a young woman, especially, to be confronted with this kind of violence. It's very violent. And this is also what Mernissi, she says, the power of the Western man resides in dictating that women, what women should wear and how they should look. He controls the whole fashion industry from cosmetics to underwear. The West, I realized, is the only part of the world where women's fashion is in men's business. Western men is using far more sophisticated method, methods than the Ayatollah. <laughs> Muslim women must hide their bodies and some their faces because of male domination, but Western women have male domination inscribed into their flesh by the demands of men's beauty ideal. I thank God I was not born as a Western girl, but as Arab Muslim one, where women can eat what they want and have the body that they want. I remember when I read this, I thought, thanks God I was born in Tunisia. <laughs> Honestly, whether I thought always it was the most, I thought like, why I am not born in Chicago or in Paris? I felt like maybe it was not that bad. So basically, um, I realized also through Mernissi's work that the image of beauty in the West hurts and humiliates women as much as the veil does when enforced by state police, like in many uh, Muslim nations. It was very funny because in, the, uh, in Tunisia, after the Arab Revolution, for the first time we see niqab, you know, the niqab. And I have a lot of difficulty with that. But when I look at it from Mernissi, a perspective and also I'm, I'm always curious so I, I have also a sister who wears a niqab and I also I, I try not to be judgmental and to go to these women and ask and actually once we are amongst women and they take off the niqab some of them not all of them some of them very clearly choose for that because they say under the niqab I have sovereignty and under the veil of my body my body can be as I want I don't have to adapt it to the outside. I came even, when I look at it from Mernissi's uh, uh, point of view, I even started having respect for veil and niqab, which something which was for me the biggest ultimate symbol of women oppression in the past was the veil, for example. And this really one of the biggest lessons I learned with Mernissi's work is to look beyond the veil. So, the, and, and, and also to come to the conclusion, like the Muslim veil, or the Western forever young and pornification veil. Pornification is this culture of pornification where, for example, there was a study in, um, uh, amongst uh, Australian and American uh, young men, and a lot of them, they said that nowadays when they want to get a little bit excited, they don't look at Hustler or Playboy anymore, they look at Cosmopolitan and Elle. Because Cosmopolitan, it's very funny, next time you, uh, you see Cosmopolitan or Elle, just look. You will see a lot of young models, 14, 16, and they are all making this pose, and this pose, and this pose, and very sexual. This is what we call the pornification. The porno image of the female body is infiltrated, the visual media, little by little, it's becoming normal. And this is something maybe when we look at Arab Muslim culture, despite all dysfunctioning, there is a still a kind of agency on the female body because the female body is not exposed and used and abused by the media like for example is in western culture and i think this is once one also of the biggest um for me insights that i learned from mernissi work it's to to not be judgmental to look beyond that veil so by the end what i also for me uh, i liked in mernissi's work mernissi's work is not about blaming men it's blame about blaming a system, the patriarchal system. I don't see, 
I hardly read any male bashing theory in Mernice's work. And that makes also that we stay more in connection with the man and that they are more willing. It's very funny because if I go, if I give a lecture or I go to Tunisia to a feminist gathering, I was saying to uh, my boyfriend, at least 40% of the room will be with men. This is something that also Arab Muslim feminists uh, 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 maybe are more aware of. Emancipation is together with men, not without a man. So the male bashing aspect is also uh, very something which we don't necessarily, we are very conscious about. And Mernissi, in all her work, she's always addressing a system, a patriarchal system, which puts men in a certain position and women in a certain position, but she's not necessarily anti-male. And her work at the end is about going beyond East and West and beyond men and women and to reach that universal dimension where it's about um, uh, cr criticizing actually to unify. And that's, I think, one of the, her uh, most uh, beautiful legacy. And of course, with Manisi, I share also the passion of belly dance, of back dance, because Manisi, she hated any form of exercise. She always said, the only form of exercise I do is belly dance. And this is something, of course, that I really love in her. She was very extravagant, uh, uh, eigenwijs, uh, um, sensual, free, uh, crazy, uh, very, very uh, big, uh, uh, like, figure of inspiration and then um, uh, I think I hope that she will be more known in, in the West also and that one day her work will be also embraced into Western literature because thanks to Mernissi also Arab Muslim feminism can also enrich something and bring something to also Western feminism. Voilà, merci.